This is a significant debate tonight. This is a significant discussion. It's significant for me because it's a personal issue also. When I was 18, this question whether the Jesus of the Bible is the real Jesus actually impacted me personally. Uh, I read a book by a, um, an Anglican bishop by, called John Shelby Spong, and he said that no scholar, no reputable scholar, believes that Jesus rose physically from the dead. And he also said no reputable scholar believes that the Jesus of the Bible is the real Jesus. And so this, uh, this was a crisis of faith for me. And for the next two years, I figured this out. Can you believe the Bible? And it's also a personal issue because the Bible itself says, if you can't believe the Bible, if you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, don't be a Christian. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 19 says this, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But, but he did not, sorry, but if he did not in fact raise him, the dead are not raised. But if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Paul is saying this, if Jesus didn't rise physically from the dead, forget about Christianity. Huge question tonight. And we have got four, four panellists here, and I'm going to introduce them. But before I do, I just want to say one thing. There's been, uh, I think I've got seven questions on my Facebook pa- you know, uh, inbox on Facebook, and, and they said, why have you got scholars for the affirmative, and why have you only got one scholar for the negative? And I asked 47 university professors here in Sydney to be on the negative, and not one of them said yes. So we tried our best uh, to get uh, both sides weighted equally, and I think we have. I think we really have, even though the, the, the people on the negative aren't teaching at a university uh, full-time, I would say they are very, very able proponents of their view. But first, the affirmative. Uh, To my direct right is Marilyn Mansfield. Marilyn is a lecturer and tutor in the Department of Studies in Religion at the University of Sydney. She submitted her PhD in January 2012. Her doctoral thesis examines the scripture texts that are attributed to John the Baptist by New Testament authors. Uh, Our other uh, panellist for the affirmative is Christopher Forbes. Christopher is a senior lecturer in ancient history and deputy chairman of the Society for the Study of Early Christianity. His fields of research and teaching focus on New Testament history, Alexander the Great and Hellenistic history, Greco-Roman history of ideas and the intersection of early Christianity and Greco-Roman culture. And for the negative, Raphael Latesta. Raphael is currently doing a Master of Arts research thesis on whether Jesus existed. The thesis has been converted into a book which will be available soon. He is hoping to eventually teach philosophy and or religious studies. Despite his research heading into sceptical territory, Raphael def- identifies himself as a Christian. Alaric Golkul. Uh, Alaric converted to Christianity in 1989 at the age of 18 in a Pentecostal church. For the next few years, he read the Bible avidly cover to cover at least once a year, preached on street corners and supported Fred Nile, so he was legit. In 1992, he began a teaching degree at the Australian Catholic University where he studied mathematics and theology. He later converted this to a BA and studied a major in both disciplines. Exposed to the scholarship of the last few centuries of biblical criticism, he began to struggle with uh, his beliefs. Knowing how and why the Bible was put together and how Christianity began, deeply challenged and changed his beliefs and eventually led him to, a- to the atheism that he holds now nearly a decade later. He has not studied these things for many years now but still maintains a passing interest in the latest debates and historical of historical and literary criticism of the Bible. Can I just ask you to welcome our panelists?
Okay, guys, I'm just going to take you through the night. First up, in about a minute, we're going to have a coin toss to see who goes first. So there's going to be uh, no uh, advantage either way from, from the outset. Then what, what we're going to do is we're going to have each person present 10 minutes of their position. We're going to go uh, one side, then the other, and uh, then the other side, and so on. And then after that, there will be a moderated discussion. In, in, in that case, we will be having a conversation on, um, on, on the stage. And then we're going to have a break for five to ten minutes. And then after that break, when we come back, there will be, a, there will be this microphone right in the middle of uh, you all. And that's when you can ask questions. Uh, and I will be going through the, uh, the way we're doing that uh, later. Um, just when, when, I didn't say this to you guys before, but basically when they get up to present their 10 minutes, at nine minutes, I will be, I will be saying nine minutes and at 10 minutes, I will be saying last sentence, please. And no matter where they're at on their argument, they have to stop. Um, could be because we got bounces. No, we haven't, but, but I'm asking (laughs) people to stop. Okay. I'm going to, um, coin toss. Alric, do you want to call? Tails? It is Tails. Would you like to go for, first? Or would... Okay, cool. Yep. Marilyn? Invite Mar- Marilyn up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you tonight. And this is a fantastic question that this debate has presented to us. Does the Bible present the real Jesus? The question of the debate asks whether we can ever know the real Jesus, or in other words, the historical Jesus. Or is the Jesus who was born, who was a child, who grew into a teenager, who matured, who died, is he forever lost to us? The quests for the historical Jesus strive to discover if the Jesus presented in the New Testament is a real representation of Jesus, of the Jesus who walked on the earth. Or is the Jesus of the New Testament simply a construction of the early church? So how can we begin to answer that question? Jesus left us none of his own writings, nor do we know if he authorised others to write about him. The non-Christian evidence for Jesus is scarce. We have a hotly contested inscription on an ossuary that mentions Jesus' name. And we have two passages about Jesus in Josephus, one that looks authentic because it's quite concise and short, and another that probably has an authentic core but has subsequently been touched up by a Christian scribe. Everything else we know about Jesus that is dated early is written by Christians and it's also written after Jesus' death. So can we tease out the Jesus who walked on the earth? And need we tease it out at all? Or should we simply accept what Rudolf Boltmann, a famous scholar, said about this topic? He said, we can know nothing about the historical Jesus except for a few sayings. But we do not need to know and we ought not to try. My resounding answer to that question would be no. I think we can discover much about the historical Jesus from the evidence that we have, and I think it is well worth the effort. And the best evidence we have about Jesus comes from writers who wrote soon after his death. So now I want you to imagine a table, an imaginary table in front of me. And on this table, we're going to place all the early accounts of Jesus, all the evidence. I was trained as an historian So therefore, we work with evidence. It doesn't matter who the subject is. It doesn't have to be Jesus. We find all the evidence and we put it on a table and we assess it. So what would be on that table? And then once we do have all the evidence on the table, as a historian, you then apply methodologies to the evidence to see if what you can or cannot know about your subject, in this case, Jesus. Now, it may come as a surprise to you that Paul is the earliest writer to mention Jesus. These early mentions are dated to the late 40s to the early 60s AD, and we know Jesus died in the early 30s. 
Paul presents a Jesus who is quite different from that described in the Gospels. But this should not really surprise us. Paul wasn't actually a disciple of Jesus. He wasn't a witness to Jesus' ministry in Roman Judea either. He also didn't seem to have a copy of the Synoptic Gospels. He spent minimal times in Jerusalem, minimal amounts of time in Jerusalem prior to writing his undisputed letters. And there are some letters that are disputed. And there were also tensions that existed between some of the apostles and Paul about his mission to the Gentiles. So Paul presents us with quite a different stream of tradition about Jesus that is not reliant on other sources. Paul's undisputed letters are therefore the first texts on our imaginary table. The next text on our imaginary table is hypothetical Q a document thought by about 80% of scholars to exist in some form. This text is thought to contain sayings of Jesus. Now, the idea of Q was developed because Matthew and Luke rely almost verbatim on... Sorry, Matthew and Luke rely on almost verbatim material that doesn't come from Mark. This is therefore a document that predates the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and is a separate account of Jesus. Q is dated to the 60s AD, so that's the next text on our imaginary table. The Gospel of Mark is also on the table. It's dated to the 60s and yet is another separate account of Jesus. Matthew and Luke use Mark and Q as sources, but they also have unique material of their own, which is derived from other sources or maybe their own or from their own hand. So Matthew and Luke are arguably dated to 60 to 80 AD. So their unique material is also on the table. So to sum up, the evidence that we have on this table are Paul's undisputed letters, Q, the Gospel of Mark, and the unique material from Matthew and Luke. Each of these is a separate account of Jesus. But I want to take you back a step to sources that are even earlier, even closer to the real Jesus. How can I say that? If we look at the prologue to Luke's Gospel, Luke says that many accounts of Jesus were circulating in his day. Now, Luke may be dated as early as 60 AD, and if that is the case already by Luke's time, there are many accounts in circulation. So we may have many more accounts to add to our imaginary table. Luke 1 verse 2 says that these accounts were handed down by eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So it seems that this group of people kept these accounts of Jesus and handed them on to Luke. This group might have even authored these accounts. Luke goes on to say that he's investigated everything from the beginning before he wrote his gospel and we can imagine his investigation would have included an investigation of these early accounts. But can these accounts be trusted? As scholars have rightly pointed out, there are so many variants of New Testament texts, from the smallest piece of text on a papyri to complete manuscripts, and there are differences in all of these variants. Add to that the differing accounts of Jesus written by the Gospel authors and Paul, and we are left wondering what really happened. For example, Matthew 2 and Luke 2 both reach the conclusion that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and was brought up in Nazareth, but they reach the conclusion by different means. Are these differences cause for us to toss out the entire story of Jesus? Or do these differences actually add to the case for authenticity? Are differences in text a strength? Let me put this another way. What if all the accounts we had of Jesus were exactly the same? What if Paul's letters, Q, Mark, Luke, Matthew, were all identical? Would we then believe that these accounts represented the true Jesus, the real Jesus. Not for a second. We would think that a scribe or scribes had colluded to create a harmony, just like someone called Tatian did. Therefore, I contend that the differences in the accounts of Jesus are the absolute core strength in these accounts. 
All the contradictions and inconsistencies in the text of the New Testament are markers of authenticity. We would expect that human authors who wrote about something they were passionately interested in, they would tell differing accounts of what they had heard of Jesus. And I believe this is the design of God. For what better way to reach human beings than through a human accounting of Jesus? Luke says something else in his prologue that is really interesting. He writes Luke and Acts to a man called Theophilus, probably a member of the elite who had received oral instruction about Jesus. Theophilus was after certainty about what he had heard. So Luke investigated everything from the beginning to give Theophilus the certainty he required. Luke probably used the many accounts that he talks about in Luke 1.1 in his investigation, but he also claims to have investigated everything from the beginning. This is an interesting idea. It's not like a reporter was tracking Jesus and writing down everything he said and and did at the moment it happened. But there were people who witnessed what Jesus did. Sometimes they witnessed a single event, but at other times they witnessed almost all of Jesus' ministry. Who were these people who literally followed Jesus from town to town and saw much of what he did? We would have to say the 12 male disciples were on the scene early, as were the women disciples. All of these people literally left everything to follow Jesus. And later in the Gospel of Luke, Luke calls these people witnesses. They saw Jesus, what Jesus did. They recounted Jesus' words and deeds to others so the message could spread. And these were the oral accounts that Theophilus had heard. So I've laid out the evidence for Jesus. There are many sources that speak of Jesus that are independent of each other. These sources were produced in the lifetime of living eyewitnesses who literally followed Jesus and then recounted his words and his deeds. These eyewitnesses were also those who held the many accounts of Jesus in safekeeping that were handed to Luke to form his gospel. Thank you. And for the negative. Oh, before I start, a little intro. Thank you. Yeah. I, before I start, I'd just like to thank Hans and the Resolve Church for hosting this event tonight and inviting us all to participate. I'm, uh, I'm wrapping up a master's thesis and writing a book on this topic, so it's good to, to be able to share it while it's still fresh in the mind. First, I'd like to say, or oh, actually, I think we should. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say this is a historical question, and it's not a battle between Christianity and atheism. Thanks for that. And we'll be putting on our academics hats tonight, as Marilyn did, and uh, we'll try and determine what we can actually say about Jesus from the sources and try and figure out. Does the Bible really portray Jesus accurately? Okay. Now, the short answer is no. Incidentally, no historian or biblical scholar who doesn't happen to be a Christian does believe that the Bible's portrayal of Jesus is accurate. I will first address the sources that are used to establish Jesus' historicity and break them down and show why they are questionable. Then I will move on to what history actually is as a discipline and show why the biblical Jesus cannot possibly be true. Part one, the problematic sources. Well, Mary's given us a great introduction of some of the sources. As you've seen, the Bible is not one book potentially written by God. It is a collection of many books written by many different authors at many different times, and it gives us many different views of Jesus. So the question itself might be a a bit funny there because the Bible doesn't really give us one view of Jesus. Now, I've got eight eight things I've got to really get through quickly, eight major points about why the sources are problematic. One is the argument from silence. The best evidence we can have are sources that are contemporary, sources that are not biased, sources that are from eyewitnesses or potentially a person in question. And when it comes to Jesus, we have none of those. I'll discuss the sources we do have in a minute. But when it comes to Jesus, we have no primary source. So we can't be sure if Jesus even existed or if these sources that are secondary sources actually portray him accurately. Now, worse than this is that some of the, some of the, um, the sources we do have 
or that we actually don't have. Some of the first century historians that we do have access to have curious deletions from their writings, which happen to coincide with the time of Jesus' birth and death. And these are found, ironically, among the works of Tacitus, who is sometimes used as evidence for Jesus, and Cassius Dio. And we can look into that further in, in question time, if we need to. So now to the, the second point, is that the sources we do have, such as the Gospels, are highly questionable. They're anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. A key part of historical methodology is knowing who wrote the text. You ask, who wrote it? Why did they write it? These things we cannot establish when it comes to the Gospels. So we do not know how reliable they are. We do know, however, and most Bible scholars do acknowledge this, that the biblical texts do contain many errors, and there are elements of fraud, such as the Comma Johannine, which is the most explicit Trinitarian verse. Now, there is, of course, no reason to suspect also that the biblical writers are infallible. They are human, and like all humans, they make mistakes. Well, actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. That's a generalization. I thought I made a mistake once, but it turns out I was wrong. <laughs> but even Dr. Forbes and Marilyn would agree that there are, there are problems with the sources in terms of the consistency. There are elements of fraud throughout. Third point is that the only non-Christian account from the first century of Jesus is from Josephus. That's all we have from the first century, and it's very late in the first century, some 65 to 70 years after Jesus' death. The problem with these passages is that they're potentially fraudulent, and even Dr. Forbes has agreed, which you, you might hear later on tonight, is that the supernatural elements of that passage in Josephus ought to be removed. They are not authentic. So clearly this is not um, authenticating the biblical Jesus. Okay, fourth point. The earliest references to Jesus, as you heard from Marilyn, comes from Paul, and Paul doesn't actually mention a historical Jesus. He mentions a Jesus that could very well have existed in the celestial planes, just as Plato had taught many years earlier among the Greek, Greek philosophies. Now, Paul uses phrases or people that may not have been Paul among the epistles, such as, had Jesus been on earth? In other words, it doesn't sound like Jesus was on earth. He also says things like, Jesus was given his name, Jesus, after his death, by God, which completely contradicts what we think we know of Jesus from the Gospels. But we must remember, the Gospels come after the epistles. We cannot read what we know of Jesus from the Gospels into the epistles. If we read Paul, Without knowledge of the Gospels, we get a totally different view of Jesus, and he's not a historical person. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, which is often used to show that Paul does mention the resurrection of Jesus, is actually talking about where he gets his sources from. His source is his direct channel from the divine. It's not from eyewitnesses. It's not from Paul himself that has seen it. It is from his, what a scholar might imagine, his imagination. And he also says that his source is the Scriptures, which is essentially, at that time, the Old Testament, as the Gospels were not around yet. So again, if we read Paul without the Gospel sources, we get a completely different view. Also, in Paul's version of the resurrection, we see him use terminology that is used for spiritual appearances. Jesus did not physically appear to anyone in Paul's writings. Fifth point, the early Christian groups, many of them actually, many of the early Christian groups, such as Gnostics and Docetics, Docetus did not believe in a literal Jesus that was a flesh and blood human being. Sixth point, evolution of the Jesus story. If you arrange the sources of Jesus in order from when they were written first, you get a clear image of a person that was originally mythical and has become more historical over time. Okay, seventh point, virtually every point of the Gospels of the Bible, in fact, can be found from earlier sources written hundreds of years earlier. They can be found in Judaism, Greek philosophy, and most worryingly for believers, pagan sources. Now, this has been overdone a bit with documentaries such as Zeitgeist, but there are indeed clear parallels that do show clear influences for the Jesus story. Now, also, eighth point, there is a curious issue with Philo. Philo of Alexandria, a Jewish historian writing just a few years before Paul. He never mentions Jesus of Nazareth. He never mentions Christians, even though he's a contemporary of Jesus and Paul. He does, however, mention this Logos figure, that if you look at the Logos figure, we don't have time to do that right now. We can look at it in question time. The Logos figure sounds exactly like Paul's Christ. He's a figure, he's a figure of sins. He's a mediator. He's divine. He's not a flesh and blood human being. In one instance, he, isn't, he even is given a name, sorry. That name is Jesus. Clear influence for Paul's cosmic Christ that would later become a historical Jesus. All right, every point that I've mentioned is actually accepted by mainstream biblical scholars, whether they accept Jesus' existence or not. 
Also, a fourth point, Kylie, my wife, my lovely wife, if you'd like to pass it around, we've got a mathematical formula there that we can discuss in question time that, if used with historical methodology, can show that the historical Jesus' chance of existing is less than 50%. The biblical Jesus' chance of existing is less than 1%. Moving on to the second point of the argument, what is history? Now, you might have to hold on to your hats here. This might sound shocking. History is not the study of what happened. We don't know what happened. We don't have a time machine. If we did, it wouldn't be a historical claim. It would be empirical. History is the study of what probably happened. Historians make probability calls. They don't know what happened. They try and figure out what happened. This causes a massive problem for Jesus. Because Jesus, part of the Jesus story, or the main part of the Jesus story perhaps, revolves around the supernatural. It revolves around miracles. This is a problem historically. Because miracles, by definition, are improbable. If you see a man walking on the ground, your reaction is not, oh my God, he's walking on the ground, he's the Messiah. Because there's nothing special about that. People walk on the ground all the time. You take the same man, make him walk on water, now you've got a Messiah. That's a miracle. Because it's so bloody unlikely. But history cannot confirm this because it's so bloody unlikely. Historical methodology directly opposes supernatural claims. It cannot prove the biblical Jesus. It cannot prove the existence of God. Related to this is the principle of analogy. The problem with the Gospels, and perhaps with the entire Bible, is that they are not analogous to what we know of how the world works, or how we think it works. It does not jive with our view of the laws of nature. They are analogous, however, to something that is quite damning to believers, mythology, fiction, Where do we find divine births, miracle births? Where do we find resurrections? We do not find them in purely historical secular accounts. Sometimes we find them in the accounts of real people, but they're not major parts of the story, nor is that all we have for those people. With Jesus, that's all we have. Moving on. Having said all that, there is a way the believer can get around the principle of analogy and the inherent unlikeliness of miracle claims. But that is something extremely difficult. It should be easy, but it's never been done in the last 10,000 years of human civilization and religion. It's never been done. That's proof that God exists. Not with a historical claim, which can't prove the supernatural. Not with an a priori claim that needs confirmation, but with empirical observation, with empirical evidence. And in this, the believer, of course, bears the burden of proof. Now, uh, I think nine minutes, we've got to wrap it up. Um, This topic is interesting because it essentially asks if Christianity is the true God. It asks, does God exist? Did he raise Jesus from the dead? After all, if God exists, there's nothing improbable about the resurrection. If God did it, that's perfectly normal. That can happen. But you must prove that God exists. So the believer has every right to believe but they have no right to claim, unchallenged, that that belief is grounded in logic, reason, and science. It is virtually impossible that the biblical Jesus existed, and we've seen that by way of sound historical methodology. If one would assert that the biblical Jesus or God exists, they bear the burden of proof, and they must provide the empirical evidence. Unfortunately, over the 10,000 years of human civilization and religion, no one has been able to do so, and that won't be changing here tonight. Thank you. Christopher Forbes. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a couple of particular statements of claim that Raphael made that I want to dispute very briefly, simply as questions of historical fact. I think he is in fact mistaken that when Paul discusses Jesus, he doesn't discuss a human being, but a celestial being. If that were the case, Paul's statement that Jesus was born a Jew, born under the law, born of a woman, would make no sense at all. What's interesting about Paul's testimony is that he clearly thinks that Jesus is both a human being and a celestial being, but that he was a human being first, became a celestial being at his resurrection. I think the claim that 1 Corinthians doesn't claim eyewitness evidence is demonstrably false. Paul actually says... More than 500 witnesses, most of whom are still alive. Sounds like a claim to eyewitness evidence to me. 
But I have no problem at all with Raphael's claim that history is about not what definitely happened, but about pro what probably happened. Historians are always dealing with probabilities because we're dealing with imperfect evidence. Imperfect evidence like the Gospels. Like every other source of information we have about the ancient world, the Gospels are partial, selective, speak from a particular point of view. Of course that's the case. That's the case for every piece of evidence we have about anything in the ancient world. But the question then becomes this, not can I prove that God exists, because I can't, and I wasn't asked to. I was asked to show that there is reasonable ground for thinking that the Jesus of the Bible is, broadly speaking, historical. And that I think you can do, and I want to do it by suggesting that if we start with Mary's table of information, table of different sources of information, we can then start applying common sense historical tests, rules of thumb if you like, to argue what parts of this material is more likely, as opposed to less likely, to be historical. And some of the rules of thumb that historians have developed in the couple of centuries of technical historical scholarship are, number one, rule of thumb, multiple attestation. A story or a saying or an idea about Jesus that occurs not just in one source, but in several sources independently is more likely to be historical than one that only occurs in one source. So something that occurs in Mark, but also occurs in stories that aren't in Mark, but that Matthew and Luke have separately, that's double attestation. And if the same idea also turns up in either John or Paul, then that's triple attestation. So the more times that a particular saying is attested, the more inherently likely it is that this idea goes a long way back. Now, of course, in sheer logical terms, that falls short of proof. And I'm perfectly happy with that. I'm happy simply to say that it pushes likelihoods. History is about probabilities. Stronger, however, is the argument that when the early Christians talk about Jesus, they report things that they themselves are obviously uncomfortable with. You can see, for example, and here I'm really treading in Mary's territory, that when they talk about Jesus being baptised by John the Baptist, they're really, really edgy because they don't want to give the impression, which they know they could give if they weren't careful, that John was actually more important than Jesus, and that's why he baptised Jesus. He had the authority, you see. He did the job. But they still report things that they are manifestly uncomfortable with. They report, for example, that Jesus didn't know, said he didn't know, when the end of the world is coming. Now, I, I submit to you that it is grossly unlikely that any early Christian is going to invent a story in which Jesus says about something as important as the end of the world, ah, uh, don't know. <laughs> nah, sorry, can't help you with that one. It seems overwhelmingly likely that this is historical, simply because it is so unlikely that anyone would invent it. There are other cases that historians call the criterion of embarrassment, which is where Jesus says things that either apparently didn't happen or didn't happen the way he suggested it. So there are all kinds of common sense tests that a historian can apply to the Gospels to ask what is more likely to be historically authentic and what is less likely to be historically authentic. And what I want to suggest to you now is a six or seven point summary of things that I would assert the great majority of scholars, be they Christians, evangelical, conservative, liberal, extremely liberal, agnostic, atheist, Jewish, Calathumpian, they all pretty well agree on these six or seven points about the historical Jesus. The first one is this. Jesus believed in the dawning intervention of God in history, which he called the coming of the kingdom of God. This is attested in Mark, it's attested in Matthew and Luke's common material, which we call Q, it's attested in material that's only in Matthew, that's only in Luke, it's all through the material, and it is overwhelmingly likely to be historical. 
Think of all the parables that Jesus starts with the words, the kingdom of God is like, and then goes on from there. He's talking about this topic all the time. Secondly, Jesus believed himself to be the God of Israel's ultimate messenger. Take, for example, his comment, if I, by the finger or spirit, Luke or Matthew, of God cast out demons, then the kingdom has come upon you. Jesus is saying his actions are the inauguration of this coming kingdom. Secondly, he sets up a group of 12 disciples. Now, what's the symbolism of that? It's fairly obvious what the symbolism is. It's saying these are the 12 new leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. But Jesus himself is the leader of the 12. Where does that put him? The leader of the 12 new leaders of the tribes of Israel? It's beginning to sound important. Then there's the titulus, the sign put on his cross, which the overwhelming majority of historians think is accurate, which is that he said he was the king of the Jews. Now, if that was the charge on which I was to be executed, I can tell you now that I would say extremely rapidly, no, I'm not. The fact that Jesus didn't is strong implied evidence that in some sense he thought he was. Now, there's other evidence as well, but it seems to me that what it strongly suggests is that Jesus believed himself to be a decisive figure in the actions of the God of Israel in the world. Thirdly, Jesus believed himself and was believed by others at the time to do exorcisms, to do miracles. This is supported by multiple attestation. It's in all the different threads of the oral tradition that leads to the Gospels we have. And it's in evidence from people who disagreed with Jesus because Jewish sources about Jesus describe him as a false prophet, a sorcerer who learnt magic in Egypt and led people astray. Note, they do not say he was a fraud, just an ordinary man. They think he did miracles too, but he was a baddie. So the evidence that we have is clear that people at the time thought Jesus did miracles. Fourth, Jesus preached God's undeserved forgiveness and offer of reconciliation. This comes up strongly under the criterion of embarrassment because it was well known in the gospel tradition that Jesus has offered God's friendship and reconciliation to prostitutes and corrupt public servants not something the early Christian movement striving for respectability really wanted to remember, but they were stuck with the fact that this is the sort of person the boss had been. Fifth. Thank you. Jesus was a critic of the religious establishment of his day who expected to be killed for his views. There's multiple sections in the Gospels that strongly support this, the most striking of which is Jesus' comment... In Matthew and in Luke, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that stones the prophets and kills those sent to you, how often have I wished I could gather you under my wings like a hen, but I couldn't do it. Frustration. Finally, Jesus believed his death would have something to do with God's redeeming activity. In Christian terms, we say it would be a sacrifice for sins. And there is evidence for this both in Paul's letters in the gospel tradition itself. Finally, Jesus believed that his task was to bring the people of Israel back to their national heritage of faith. But he also believed that this would have effects for non-Jewish people after his death. These claims, I submit, would be agreed to by the overwhelming majority of historians studying the historical Jesus. Can we have another drink over here, actually, two? Yep. Yeah, Yep. Cool. Thank you. Only the atheist brought a Bible.
<laughs> wrong. Ah, oh, OK, you got it. Oh, I don't know what Jesus would have thought about Apple. <laughs> Okay, I happen to agree that this is a pretty important uh, topic, especially if you're a believer. This is pretty much the most important topic you can, you can have. Um, I'm going to start with an apology to any believers that are here. Uh, people who uh, were instrumental in leading me out of Christianity were very gentle. I don't have time to be gentle in 10 minutes, so I, I'm going to just jump into it. Um, I'm going to start with Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. It's uh, Peter giving his first spiel. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Now, this is all probably, you know, pretty passe to most of you. That's pretty sensible, a pretty sensible way to talk about Jesus if he was historical. Now, as Marilyn said... The first testament that says that Jesus was anyone historical, anyone in history, was Mark. Earliest that he could have written that is the 60s. That's like 30 years later. Before that, much before that, I disagree with her dating of of Paul. Um, I'd say 50s at the latest. Never talks about a historical Jesus. In fact, none of the epistles do. None of them. A lot of them came after the Gospels, so you'd expect that at least copy a bit. But we've got 22 documents from Romans to Revelations. About 80,000 words, roughly 12 different writers, all of them Christian, 500 references to Jesus or the Son Um, a few the lords, never, get this, never Jesus of Nazareth. Not a single epistle writer talks about Jesus of Nazareth. And you believers, I want you to go home and read your Bibles. Never talks about a Jesus of Nazareth. Never talks about born of Mary. Never talks about died under Pilate. Nothing that would place this man in history ever appears in any of the epistles. He's talking, and the other thing with Paul, and I'm going to go to Galatians now, chapter 1, verse 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure you're all aware of uh, his conversion experience, getting struck down on the road to Damascus, again in the book of Acts. Um, A book, incidentally, that was written in the second century. So, you know, nowhere near the time that, that any of this happened. Um, now, we have a few exceptions to, to this. Uh, I'm sure the, the, my opposition are jotting down one Thessalonians, maybe, two, 15 to 16, um, which I think I've got marked here somewhere. Talking about the Jews. Oh, for you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your countrymen, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. Which kind of sounds like, well, that that puts it in history. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles, blah, 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 blah. 
Um, but the wrath has come upon them to the utmost, which is an obvious, I would think everyone would agree, reference to the Jewish war and what happened to the temple, uh, which was a long time after Paul. So this is an obvious uh, interpolation. Someone's added it afterwards because maybe because they're embarrassed that Paul never talks about a historical figure. 1 Timothy 6.13 thought by many scholars to not fit in um, to the surrounding text and thought to be a later edition. Even if you say, no, it's definitely part of the text, even if you ignore all those scholars that say otherwise, also dated 2nd century. Um, and then you've got 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. And that's Paul talking about uh, what we call the Last Supper, what he calls the Lord's Supper, and that is not, again, not a historical thing that he's talking about. Uh, the saviour god Mithras also had a story, and again, I don't want to go too, too much down that path because there's been a few dodgy scholars who have gone that way, but uh, Mithras also had a, a strong tradition in that vein, and yeah, there's a lot of cross-pollination in that, that sense. Now, I've got, I've got a lot of uh, biblical quotes here that I was going to do, but I just want to talk about um, what Dr. Forbes said. Multiple attestation. Now, there's been five, to six, five or six authors that have written about Sherlock Holmes. Multiple attestation. Sherlock Holmes definitely existed by the same argument. James Bond also. Many authors written about James Bond. They all agree on a lot of things. Some of them disagree on some things, but those things they disagree on definitely must have happened because, as Marilyn said, if it's different, differing accounts are proof. Um... The symbolism, really, the symbolism, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, and that symbolism is supposed to show that it actually happened. I would think symbolism would show that someone thought, well, this is a good idea, we'll put 12 disciples in and that'll show that Jesus is the head of them, so he's the head of the 12 tribes. Well, that's a good thing. Write that in. Um, embarrassment. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm flabbergasted. I, I can't see how that could possibly prove historicity. I mean, because someone was embarrassed about something or, or someone didn't know something in a fictional story. So, some, I, I mean, you know, the things that Hermione didn't know in Harry Potter um, must have happened because, well, Hermione's supposed to know everything and... She didn't, so it must have happened. Um, and I'm interested to know what Jewish sources Dr. Forbes has access to that no other scholar has access to, contemporary to Jesus, to talk about him working miracles. <laughs> Never heard of them. Um, maybe we can get to that in question time. Um, Now, I'm not sure if you all know this, but Nazareth as a town did not exist until 120 CE. Uh, so that was a, mis, a mistranslation. Uh, I think everyone would agree from that Mark was reading. Well, we don't know because he, he said, according to the scripture the Messiah should be a Nazarene. He quotes it. We don't have access to that scripture, so we don't know where he got it from. But Nazarites or Nazarenes being a, a, a cult within Judaism, he's gone, Nazarene, I must have come from Nazareth. No such place. So he also didn't know the geography of Galilee um, to put a town in that didn't exist, that was settled some 80 years later. Um, 
Mm. Actually, and that'll do. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, basically what I'm going to do is kind of throw a question out there to, to the guys on the stage. And um, I've got a bunch of questions written down. And, um, and then there hopefully will be discussion. You guys got a, um, a microphone near you. Is everyone working? Everyone's mic working? Hello, uh, hello. Yes. Yep, yep. Hello, we're here. Hello. Okay, cool. Okay, the first question, Alaric, I, I just want to um, jump in and ask the question, Nazareth didn't exist. Now, you said that um, Nazareth didn't exist till one, uh, 120, mm -hmm. but you also said uh, Mark wasn't written, Mark was written around 60 mm -hmm. AD. So how, like, why would he insert a city that doesn't exist yet? Because he didn't know it didn't exist. Because he didn't know Galilean geography. Okay. But, okay, C can I throw this over to the other side? Nazareth didn't exist. Not true. Okay. Archaeological remains have been found from Nazareth from the first century BC and the first century AD. Nazareth is not mentioned in Jewish sources. That's certainly true. But that's because, to put it bluntly, it was a fly speck. It was six or seven buildings. It was a little tiny place. Can I just interject there? The Bible talks about the city of Nazareth. And you're talking about a fly speck. That's correct. The uh, word can so, be used. So either he so even by your account, he's calling a fly speck a city. Yeah, well, the archaeological evidence says that it was a graveyard at the time of Christ, that there was nothing else there. Well, well wait, can, can, sorry, can, can, I jump, can, can I just jump okay. in and ask the question? Because one, one of the frustrating things about a debate like this is both sides are going to say, well, archaeological evidence says this, scholars say this. So what, what I'm going to ask you to do is actually say, this is the book in which it's written in, or this is the article, or... No, actually, no, that, that, that's not so much. Or, or Google it. Can, can I ask you to, both sides, I'm asking both sides to say where, where this argument is from um, so that we don't go, you know, one scholar says this, one scholar says this. Let, let's get scholar Freddie Blog said X. Um, okay. Yep. I actually think it was less than a fly speck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alaric, you're not calling it a fly speck, though. You're saying it didn't exist till no, 120. No, the, no. If, uh, and I don't, I don't have a source. I'm sorry. I, I don't memorise all my sources. Okay. But uh, I, I'd encourage anyone who is interested to Google it and uh, look at the actual evidence. But it, it, from what I've read, it was uh, it, a graveyard was all they could find from dating from that time. So... Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll go on to my next question. Marilyn, um, you talked about Q, and I, and I think most uh, everyone mentioned Q, but this is a hypothetical document, an absolute... We don't possess it. Um, scholars disagree about its content, its makeup. In fact, one of my favourite historical Jesus scholars, a guy named John P. Meyer, in his second uh, volume of uh, Rethinking uh, the Historical Jesus, a marginal Jew Rethinking the Historical Jesus, says that scholars should look into the mirror daily and say, uh, Q is a hypothetical document that we basically don't know exists and no one agrees on. So why... If no one agrees on it, we haven't got a copy of it, why should we actually, one, believe it exists, and two, bring it up as a historical document because we don't have it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. I think the answer to that is that we have Matthew and Luke as um, quoting verbatim um, similar 
a similar source. And so the easiest way to explain that is they must have had a source underlying their Gospels that they used um, because... Oh, sorry. Um, they must have had a document that what they both used that explains this verbatim agreement that's not found in Mark. So both Matthew and Luke have a copy of Mark. We know that. But the things that they share that don't come from Mark, we say there must have been a hypothetical document. It is hypothetical. No text has been found. But in, in 80% of scholars would agree that there's some underlying text. We happen to call it Q, but um, it could be called anything else. It's just a text that they share. Okay, could, I just, could I just interject there? When it comes to hypothetical sources... As you've seen, there's been a lot of discussion of hypothetical sources and how important they are to the case of Jesus. And that just goes to show how good the case for Jesus is. We need to resort to sources that do not exist. Okay? These sources do not exist. We don't have access to them. In the case of Q, it's somewhat irrelevant. One thing I've noticed during this debate is that the opposition has sort of done our job for us. They have presented reasons to believe in a historical Jesus. They have not really presented reasons to believe in the biblical Jesus. They have provided no evidence for the miracle portions of the stories, for example. Arguing that there may have been a historical Jesus is my job. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. But as for, the, as for the hypothetical sources, I wouldn't place too much emphasis on that. I mean, you've got the potential that the Gospels are copying each other. You don't have to have another source. There's plenty of different theories around what potential sources there are. But it's an incredibly uncritical historical methodology to just invent the sources that you would like to see. Bart Ehrman does this in his latest book. Normally he does fantastic work, but his latest book was very much a letdown. He basically got around the problem. We, mentioned, we both mentioned a problem, Alaric and I, that there is a massive issue with Paul being the first Christian writer, yet he does not portray the Jesus we see in the Gospel. The Gospel, the gospel Jesus is very different, very much more a historical, uh, sorry, a, a historical character, so-called. But uh, as Alaric mentioned, Paul never places Jesus at a certain time and place. And the way Bart Ehrman gets around this problem is to invent gospel sources, invent sources that predate Paul that don't actually exist. And when it came to other sources, when it came to different parts of Paul's writings, he refuted such methodology in the same text. It is incredibly uncritical. Um, also, when it comes to the text we do have, if you could just mention something on the criterion of, the criteria of authenticity, the criterion of embarrassment was mentioned. These criteria are completely corrupt, or at least the way in which they are employed by mainstream biblical scholars is completely corrupt, and they have even been criticized by biblical scholars themselves, such as J.P. Meyer, who was mentioned earlier. Now, the problem with these criteria, such as the criterion of embarrassment, is that we're basically guessing. We don't know what the biblical writers would have actually found embarrassing. We really don't know. Sometimes embarrassing points are made to make a specific point, to stress humbleness, for example, humility. Sometimes it's done on purpose. We have stories from the mystery religions that Attis was castrated. That is an incredibly embarrassing thing to Romans, yet that was a key part of their, of their mystery religion. So we really don't know. It's just guessing when you're using the criterion of embarrassment. Also, independent historian Richard Carrier points out that any reason to keep a section of the Bible, because remember, the Bible was basically put together by very powerful Christians at different times, any reason to keep a certain part of the Bible is also reason to fabricate it. Every line of the Bible is there for a reason. You can't say, oh, that's embarrassing, therefore that must have happened. Okay, so the criteria and how they're employed, totally corrupt. There's other examples. You've got the criterion of Aramaic context and the criterion of Greek context, which basically, basically says that every word of the Bible must be true because it's all written in Aramaic and Greek. You've also got the criterion of Aramaic context being completely nonsensical because if a phrase in the Bible does sound like it may have had an Aramaic original, so what? Was Jesus the only Aramaic-speaking Jew of first century Palestine? That notion is ridiculous. You've also got other contradictory... Last point, sorry, before we move on. You've also got more contradictory um, authenticity criteria, such as the criterion of least distinctiveness and the criteria... The criterion, sorry of vividness. So basically it's saying, if a story has a lot of detail, it must have happened. 
If a story is brief, it must have happened. Once again, every word of the Bible is validated. It all must be true. That is not critical historical methodology. In a sentence, most of those are criteria I didn't use because I agree with you that they are a little bit dodgy. (laughs) Multiple attestation, though, is a start. I think we can do better on the criteria of dissimilarity and embarrassment. And your comment that these criteria are corrupt strikes me as a little odd. Are you actually saying that the great majority of scholars on this subject are corrupt? And if you are, why isn't Richard Carrier one of them? I noted how they are employed, how they are used. This is even mentioned by biblical scholars themselves, such as J.P. Meyer, in his book, A Marginal Jew. But Meyer uses the criteria. He does, and he also criticizes. Can I just say on multiple attestation, we've got the Gospel of Mark, and then we've got two Gospels that copy Mark, great wads of Mark, um, how is that another attestation? That's someone who's gone, gee, that's a really good idea, putting this Jesus character in history, but I reckon I can go one better. You're absolutely right. That isn't good argument. What we're talking about is multiple independent attestation, which is when Luke or Matthew use it when they didn't get it from Mark, or when John or Paul use it when they didn't get it from Mark. Cases that are just copying don't count as independent attestation, of course not. hang on, but they're copying the idea of a a historical Jesus. They're, They're parroting Mark in saying there's a historical Jesus. Surely you can see that. They, they, use Jesus, they use Mark in part, but they also have their own unique material that doesn't parrot Mark. So why couldn't that be made up? It could be. It's just historically unlikely that it was. That's exactly the problem. Once again, we are using sources that we don't know exist. We don't know what they say. Uh, no, we know what and Mark of course, exists. There is no reason to say, oh, there's all these bunch of sources behind the gospel that we don't actually have access to. It could be very On well... On the imaginary table. That Yes, that's right, on the fake table. It could be, be very well that particular gospel writer's interpretation. And that we see throughout history. It's, it's interesting that we can always find a reason to say that it could very possibly be something else. It could very possibly be that but that's Jesus the whole was point. a traffic policeman. Yes, but that's, but what that's we the want is the evidence. The, the whole evidence point is that, that we need Q exi- The evidence that Q existed is the material in Matthew and Luke that they did not get from Mark and which they seem to have in common or have slight variations on material in common which make it look highly unlikely that they got it from each other. Yes, it's hypothetical, but historians do this with other sources too, not just the Bible. I agree, uh, okay, can, I agree can, can with can you. I, can, I, can I just jump in there and say, mm-hmm. I don't want to be traffic cop here, but one of the things, let's not talk over each other. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I just, let's show respect for each other, listen and respond in, in kind. I'm saying this to both sides, okay? Yep. But how would you respond? Yep. Oh, did you want to respond to that? What was the last point? Oh, it's sorry. Okay. Sorry, what, what was your last point, Chris? My last point was that historians don't just do this with the Bible. Historians try to work out what the sources behind Tacitus and Cassius Dio were. Historians try to work out what the sources right. behind Josephus are. Sure. This sure. is standard historical methodology. And yep. yes, it's about probabilities. On that point, you are absolutely right. History is about probabilities. Yep. Can, can, I, I, I can I just say something it. there? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, like a dog being wait, 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 get out of the car. <laughs> the, um, the, the stuff that's different, um, there's lots of reasons why it's different. They're writing to different audiences. Uh, the redaction um, criticism, that, that go, I mean, you, you can see why they've changed stuff. I, I don't understand what, how it being different would be multiple attestation. They, they, want to, they want their Jesus to be more like this, so they give more scripture references in the case of Matthew. So he's getting his Jesus from scripture, not from history. He's looking at the Old Testament saying it prophesies that he'll be a virgin, mistranslation in the Septuagint from the, the uh, Hebrew Alma. Virgin, okay, well, put that in. He's born of a virgin. Um, that's an interesting hypothesis. 
you've proposed a theory about the origins of the idea of the virgin birth there. My problem with your hypothesis about the origins of the virgin birth is that as far as I'm aware, no Jewish person until the early Christians read that passage of Isaiah and said, ha ha, prophecy of the Messiah. In other words, unless you already believed in a virgin birth for some other reason, there's no reason you'd leap at that passage. My point is that the early Christians already believed in the virgin birth and found a testimony to it. They didn't make it up out of Scripture. They found it confirmed in Scripture. Okay. Um, An ironic point of what was said earlier by Dr. Forbes is that we've actually all pointed to uncertainty when it comes to the biblical stories about Jesus. The whole point of this debate is trying to establish if the biblical Jesus existed. Now, I would argue that if we need certainty, it is certainty of the biblical Jesus. Ambiguity actually helps the skeptic, not the believer. We need to be sure that the biblical Jesus existed. Okay, maybe a historical Jesus existed, but we really don't know if a biblical Jesus existed. Now, he may have been a plumber, or or whatever example you gave. That is actually possible. He said it as a joke, but it's true. That is more possible than that he was resurrected from the dead by God. Of these miracle claims, of which we need to be certain in order to be Christians, not one shred of evidence has been presented. All we have heard so far is basically what we should have been saying, is that yes, there could have been a historical Jesus. But the miracle claims, there is no evidence, there is no reason to believe in those. And that, I think, is the crux of the issue. Could I just ask, what would provide the certainty to you? What would you need to provide certainty? I I provided already in the conclusion of, of my talk, and that was prove the existence of the Christian God. Because the resurrection itself is pretty much, I would think, the key doctrine of Christianity. I mean, if the resurrection didn't happen, you might as well, might as well forget it. Uh, or fundamentalist Christianity anyway, not a Gnostic stream. Now, that is an extremely unlikely event. Okay, We're talking about, throughout the Bible, we're talking about very, very unlikely events. No certainty is provided. However, if God exists, the Christian God, not any God, not Zeus, not Thor, not the flying spaghetti monster, if God exists and God did it, it's not improbable. It's very likely. But we have seen no evidence that God exists. Not yet. Okay, I'm going to go to another question that I have got. Um, Just a historical question. You guys both mentioned um, the Gospels and the the New Testament relying on pagan sources. And that is, I mean, that's Dan Brown. I I don't mean to... um, you know, put down your argument, but but th- that is widely held b- by a lot of people. Um, a historical question for me: Why would Jews, especially because we know they're extremely sectarian, why would they go and borrow from myths, from pagan myths, when uh, all the evidence we have in Second Temple Judaism? says they put a distinction between themselves and the pagan world. Because that's how you start a religion. Syncretism. That is one of the main, re- that's one of the main uh, parts of starting a new religion. Yeah. And what we see, I, I mean, I agree that it has been overdone a bit, the pagan parallels. There probably is no one template of, wow, that's exactly Jesus. That's beside the point. That is really beside the point. If it would be exactly the same as Jesus' story, we wouldn't need a new religion. Christians would just be followers of, of, of uh, Dionysus, for example, or, or Osiris, who actually was a, a bit of a resurrecting god. But what is important are the parallels. There are clear themes that are seen in fiction, in mythology, such as miraculous births. Five to six hundred years before the story of Jesus, we see miraculous birth of Buddha. Five to six hundred years before Jesus turning water into wine, Dionysus did the same thing. Centuries before Jesus was resurrected, we see stories of Romulus and Osiris Sorry, being resurrected. The, first one? The, themes, the themes are there. Stories of who and Osiris? The first example was Buddha. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Who may or may not have been a, a, a real character. Okay, cool. I'll throw that over to, the, to you guys and say, uh, these guys are saying it's obvious the New Testament borrowed from pagan sources. How would, how would you respond? Would you agree, disagree? And uh, what evidence do you have for your position? I think it's important to say that if you Google it, you will find an amazing amount of information claiming these sorts of parallels. 
and the closer you look at them, the fewer turn out to be there. Miraculous births? Yes, lots of them. Births claim to be when the mother was a virgin? Actually not. Actually not. The ancient mythical religions don't make that claim. Miraculous births, yeah, dozens of them, no problem, lots of legends. The idea that somebody could rise from the dead in history, actually not. The idea that a dying and rising God might die every winter and come back every spring, that's Osiris, that's Cybele, that's that kind of thing. Yes, you find that, but the idea that it might happen under Pontius Pilate, No, you don't find that. In other words, a lot of the claims that are made don't actually stand up very well to historical analysis. The one I really want to comment on, though, is not the mythological one. I want to comment on the claim that the letters of Paul, which are the earliest evidence, don't talk about a historical figure. I think this is nonsense. In Galatians 1.19, just eight verses after Galatians 1.11, Paul talks about James, the Lord's brother. If the Lord has a brother who, J- who, Jesus, who Paul has actually met, that seems to suggest that Jesus was a brother of that brother and therefore probably a historical figure. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians 9... Can, 5, I, can I answer that one first? You what, may. What I, co- Romans 8.29 says Jesus is, is the firstborn of many brethren. He does. So it's a religious term. It is not an actual factual historical term. In Romans, you're absolutely right. In Galatians, you're clearly not. He's talking about a particular person called James. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Go on. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. The Lord's brothers and Cephas, which is just Aramaic for Peter. Paul takes it for granted that Jesus is a recent historical figure born of a woman born under the law, that's in Galatians, i.e. a Jewish person born under the law, as Paul himself was. I think it's simply nonsense to say Jesus, uh, Paul doesn't believe in a historical figure. He believes in a recent historical figure and he's met his brother. How would you guys respond? No, no. <clears throat> Back to the other issue. What, 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 okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do both. Okay, okay you'll do both. Okay, good. There are a few early Christian church fathers that actually admit to pagan parallelism with Christianity. As for uh, this issue, Alaric is exactly right. The brother of the Lord does not have to be a literal term. Not only are we talking about highly allegorical texts, but important Christians, uh, important early church fathers have also noted, I think it was Origen, I may be mistaken, but I think it was Origen who noted that when Paul said that James was the brother of the Lord, he actually, um, actually meant that allegorically. He meant it as in brother in the faith. He did, he spe- Origen specifies that he did not mean that. It was a literal brother. Do you know why Origen said that? Why is that? Because Origen was deeply embarrassed by the idea that Mary might have had other children. He had theological reasons for not wanting that to be Jesus' literal brother. And that's a third century did, source. As they all did. Hmm? But other sources also show people claiming to be brothers or sisters of the Lord, or not necessarily of the Lord, but of a divine figure, when it actually wasn't the case. We have seen in the works of Josephus, I forget which Caesar exactly it was, um, I think it may have been Augustus, who claimed to be the brother of Jupiter. Now, obviously, that's a ridiculous claim. Jupiter is not a historical character, and Jesus doesn't necessarily have to have been a historical character either. Brother or sister of a figure does not literally have to can be I, can I just interrupt actual brothers or sisters. For a sec? If that's the best you got, you're really tugging at straws, aren't you? Like, if that is the best evidence that... Paul is talking about a historical Jesus. Well, where's Jesus of Nazareth? Where's all of the other things that were in the first speech of Peter in Acts? Like, why? Why is the? Why doesn't he ever quote Jesus? If Paul. Jesus is the founder of the movement, Paul. why does Paul never quote? Never say when he's trying to make an argument. Never says, and Jesus said this, so you should believe it. But he does. Most of 1 Corinthians 7 hangs on several quotations from things Jesus said. Large chunks of Romans 12 seem to be based on things Jesus said. But they're not based 
on the Gospels, which haven't been written yet. They're based on the shared tradition that the early Christians had. But back to your point about why don't they mention Jesus of Nazareth, on your grounds, they couldn't possibly, because Nazareth hadn't been built yet. Because he didn't exist. But it did exist. But it was a fly speck town, and they didn't bother mentioning it. Once again, we're deferring to imaginary sources that do not exist. As for Paul quoting Jesus, he does not quote Jesus. Sometimes he actually says something that might sound like it's something that Jesus actually said, but he does not use Jesus' authority, which is quite surprising. Because if I was speaking for Jesus, if I was preaching, I would say, Jesus said this, Jesus said that, God said this, God said that, because I have no authority. Neither does Paul. Jesus had authority. Why doesn't he say, Jesus said this? In fact, there are other issues where he just completely ignores what Jesus taught and gives his own opinion. That's right. He gives his own opinion. And you think, well, hang on. Why isn't he giving, why isn't he saying, Jesus already touched this issue? But why he does. Why is he starting this now? But he does. Because and in he... fact, there are other parts where, Jesus, where Paul actually says, now the truth is being revealed to you. Paul is writing about 20, 25 years, 30 years maybe after the death of Jesus. He's not saying 20 or 30 years ago there was a guy, uh, a guy born in Nazareth, a guy under Pontius Pilate who was killed and taught all these things and brought us the truth. Now the truth is being brought to you. Okay, I'll ask Marilyn to respond. So um, Paul does say that he is passing on to his readers the commands of Jesus. What I tell you are the commands of Jesus. Correct. And he also says, not I but the Lord says certain things. And he also says, I and not the Lord says certain things. Correct. So there are elements in... In Paul's writings that do mention commands of Jesus and the fact he's quoting Jesus. Incorrect. 1 Corinthians 7.10. No, no. no. 1 Paul Corinthians gives us 7, his sources. 10. He gives us his sources. He says that his sources are the Galatians scriptures, 1, which is the Old Testament, and he also says his source is his direct revelation from the divine. We must remember, Paul never met Jesus physically. Paul's Jesus is spiritual. He only met Jesus in visions. He gets his information from God and from the Bible. He did not meet a physical person. He did not get his information from eyewitnesses, nor was he an eyewitness himself. Excuse Paul even me. says he opposed this is not Peter correct. to his face. Is it 1, is 1 Corinthians 11.10? No, 1 Corinthians 7.10. That he did not speak to eyewitnesses is obviously not correct. In, one, in Galatians, he talks about spending 15 days with Peter and also meeting James. I said there is no reason to believe that he got his information from eyewitnesses. When Paul names his sources, Does he ever say, I got this from Peter who saw all this? No. He says, I got this from the Old Testament and I got this from my direct revelation. I did not get this from Peter. Yeah, true. Sorry, what do you make of 1 Corinthians 7.10? He says about marriage. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, a wife must not separate from her husband. That is what Jesus said about divorce. Uh, No, that's what... Mark said that Jesus said, yes. who had, who had. Mark is a later document. Once again, that's right. Exactly. And Paul independently seems to know the story. Once again, you are Quite. using non-existent earlier sources. No, I'm quoting one Corinthians. <laughs> okay, so so You're Paul using writes. Authority hang, hang on, hang on. Paul writes one exist. Corinthians. Yep. And 55 then AD. Decades. Well, decades later, or a decade later, at least. Yep. Mark writes the same thing and says Jesus said it, and you're saying that that proves that Jesus was historic? I don't no, know what I'm, that proves. I'm saying that Paul is quoting Jesus, which you claim no. he never does. Yeah, he, okay, he gets, he gets, he says in uh, Galatians 1, he says that. I don't get this from men, I get this from Revelation. Yes, what's he talking about in Galatians 1? Is he talking about everything he's ever said, or is he talking in a specific context about one kind of thing? Well, he never met Jesus. That's true. Okay. But he did meet Peter and James. Right. In the same letter, Galatians. Right. My point is that when Paul says his his gospel... His gospel is something he got direct from Jesus. He doesn't mean every single thing he ever said. He means his gospel of the gospel of salvation for Gentiles without circumcision or the law of Moses. But what I don't understand is that you seem to be incapable of 
even speculating that someone writing something 10 years after something was written down might copy that or might put, in, insert that into their account. Of Absolutely, a they might. But there is no evidence at all that Mark has read Paul's letters. No, true. true. So it's unlikely that Mark is getting it from Paul. He's in a Christian community, though. He is. Mark, okay, which is... So they can both be quoting the same source? Uh, well, no, because one's a figment of Paul's imagination, his revelations of Jesus, the divine... No. Paul clearly says that there is information he got which he shares with the rest of the Christian church. He talks about traditions that were handed down to yeah. him. He quotes Jesus not just in 1 Corinthians 7.10, but in oh, a half well, well, dozen well. other places. When he, he, ne- he doesn't say traditions that were handed down to him. Yes, he, he says does. traditions that he got from on high. No, he says both. Okay, where does he say the other one? Where he says traditions that were handed down to me. He says it in 1 Corinthians uh, 11 and 15. 11 talking about the Lord's Supper, 15 talking about the resurrection. Again, we're talking about the Lord's Supper. Again, Paul mentions that he got this information from his direct channel to the divine. From exactly. He got, it, exactly. he got it from his direct channel to the divine. He his does not say that from the about the 20, 20, verse 23. From my witnesses, if I can remember nor rightly. was he an eyewitness. I think we're getting uh-huh. sidetracked. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Go on. No, no, no that's, go on. that's his source. I received from the Lord. What Lord is he talking about? Is he talking about the Lord in his head that he met on the road to Damascus? It's a question. Go on. Well, that, what that, did he that, we're talking from about the, the source. What did he receive? That the Lord from the Jesus Lord? in the night which he was betrayed took bread. And then he goes on to tell the story of what we call the Lord's Supper. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, the question is this Did he receive it from the Lord directly or by a series of human intermediaries? The he answer, didn't receive it from men. He specifically says no, that he no, doesn't, doesn't receive say, his doesn't revelation say that about from the men. Lord's Supper. You, you see, what you've done is you've taken one passage in Galatians where Paul says specifically about one thing that he oh, okay. hadn't received it from men but That's from the Lord. Of reading it. And you're presuming that that applies to everything Paul says, and it simply doesn't. He never says he gets it from men. The point we have made is Ever. that when Paul does name his sources, his yes. name sources are his imagination and the existing Old Testament. Now, I feel we're actually going in circles here <laughs> because, once again, we're sort of discussing the historicity of Jesus, which really isn't the point of the debate. I mean, it's quite possible there was a Jesus. It's not offensive to atheists if there was a Jesus. It's probably beneficial to atheists if there was a Jesus. And we had actual secular sources of a Jesus that was smoking pot, hanging around with prostitutes, you know, for business. That would, might, an atheist might like that. But the point here is that we should be discussing the biblical Jesus and the reasons why we should accept the biblical Jesus. We have still have not seen any evidence why we should accept the miracle claims, which are inherently extremely unlikely. When another religion makes miracle claims, we dismiss it as myth. But when it's Christianity, we say, well, this time it really did happen. This time it happened. Okay, can, can, can I ask a question? One of the things I, I just want to pick up, Christopher, you said that there was uh, a, a, a text uh, in Judaism which talks about Jesus being a, um, uh, a deceiver of the per- people, a magician. Yes. Now, Alaric said mm. no scholars ever said that. I mean, no one believes that, really. That's, that, that's what Alaric said. A contemporary says. source. Not, yeah. Correct. That is correct. It is not a contemporary source. It is a later source. Centuries later. It's in the Babylonian Talmud. It is centuries later. But the point is simply this. Even centuries later, Jewish people didn't say, nah, he was just a fraud. They said he was a wizard. In other words, even centuries later, Jewish people believed Jesus had done miracles. I'm not saying that that proves he did. Specifically what I said was, he was believed to do miracles at the time. And the reason I said that 
is that the Gospels report that Jewish writers, uh, sorry, that Jewish authorities at the time claimed he did so by the power of Beelzebub. In other words, they didn't say, no, he's just pretending. They said, he's demonic. So, so what you're saying is the people of the time were uncritical enough to believe anyone could do miracles? No. That may have been what you could imply from what I said, but it is not what I was saying. I was saying that people at the time did believe in it, some of them more critically than others. But your point still stands in general principle. I don't think we can prove that Jesus did miracles. What I've been trying to prove is that the broad picture of Jesus that historians believe in looks surprisingly like the Jesus of the New Testament. Okay, guys, we're going to stop there. We're going to have a 10-minute break. Go and grab a drink, go to the toilet, come back. We're going to put a uh, microphone right in the middle of you guys and this is your chance to ask any question you want. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Now, guys, um, this is your chance to ask questions. Now, um, I will ask people to line up behind the um, behind the mic. Now, I, I just want to say this: if if um, I will be the moderator of the questions, if, if there is a question that is off topic, I will say it's off topic. The other thing is if I think that a question shows disrespect to any of our panellists, I will ask you to rephrase the question. Okay, so two rules. You can ask anything as long as it's on topic and be respectful. So we've got a questioner. Go for it, mate. Goodness. Thank you. Uh, my name's Nick. Um, just a question to Dr Forbes. Um, just in relation to the concept of um, multiple attestation um, providing uh, uh, greater weight to a claim. Excuse me, can you just speak up a little sure. bit? Yeah, so just in relation to the concept of, of multiple attestation of a particular topic lending strength to the likelihood of that claim being uh, true, I think, have I perhaps paraphrased you correctly there? That's, that's what I'm claiming, yes. Okay. Um, uh, just from a from a legal perspective, from from working as a lawyer for ten years, um, uh, and knowing the the fallibility of eyewitness testimony, and I just wanted to use as an analogy to that um, to that notion um, the concept of alien abductions. We could, for example, get a dozen uh, people in this room tonight who could attest to having been abducted, first hand reports. Uh, we could get. Uh, accounts from groups of people all around the world who have told consistent stories and who might even have been who might even claim to have been abducted together uh, we could read reports of sightings uh, by whole towns of people uh, we could see that these reports have been going on for decades they've been reported by various media sources and even in many periodicals how many people would sincerely believe that these accounts are true i don't would you? The answer is no, I don't. And your question is a legitimate one because if we make the criterion of multiple attestation the be all and end all, then obviously it's not sufficient. What historians do is they use a brace of techniques together. They use independent attestation as one, they use some of the others that uh, Raphael mentioned as supporting evidence. Now, you're absolutely right. Eyewitnesses are fallible. And reports derived from eyewitnesses are therefore more fallible because there's an extra level of transmission and you would call it hearsay. But nonetheless, historians have to work with imperfect sources for everything they do. And so what we do is work out rough and ready methods, you would call them rules of evidence, to apply, and we apply multiple different rules of evidence, as many as we can apply, to each case. One thing I didn't say earlier, that I, because I hit my nine and a half minutes, was that these criteria actually only act in a supporting role. 
When you think about human memory, human memory is good on overall impressions. It is less good on precise details. For example, in two years' time, you will probably remember the general shape of this debate reasonably well, but you may get confused as to who specifically said what. My argument is that the Gospels present us with a credible, broad picture of a human being in first century Galilee And we can argue about specific details, but the overall impression that Jesus made has a higher chance of being historical than any particular element that makes it up. The overall impression is more likely to be historically accurate, and then we test it against the details using the criteria. Next question. Just a a very small brief question. Um, Is I just wanted confirmation, and perhaps for the benefit of theists in the room and also for atheists in the room, that there is no single eyewitness account in the Bible. So everything we read of in terms of the resurrection and the virgin birth, there is no single eyewitness account. Every account is from someone who claims to have spoken to an eyewitness or who has claimed to have spoken to someone who has claimed to have spoken to someone who has claimed to have spoken to someone who was an eyewitness. I just wanted confirmation. That depends on what you think about the authorship of the Gospel of John. If you think, as a proportion of scholarship does, that John really is John, the son of Zebedee, then some of John's gospel is likely to be eyewitness, yes. But if he isn't that person, and that's certainly a respectable scholarly view, then you are correct. None of it is eyewitness. It is second-hand or more. Thank you. And, JC? And that, that none of it... They don't even claim that they've spoken to eyewitnesses. Oh, except yes, maybe do. for uh, Luke. Luke and Paul. Yeah, yeah, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we'll, we'll go to JC. Hi, this is for the affirmative as well. Um, so my question relates to really how much can we know about the historical Jesus? You've already admitted that the miracles in the Gospels, the best that we can say as far as external sources, are that Jews centuries later uh, said that if there were miracles, maybe he was an evil sorcerer. Um, what do we know about where he was born? We know that the Gospels disagree about why he was in Bethlehem. We know that that they were essentially trying to fulfil prophecy through their their writing of of history. Uh, Why can't we extend this to other things? We know Nazareth didn't exist at the time. We know it existed previously and after the time of Jesus, but not during. And, and, so, and we know that synagogues did not exist at, at, in, in Jerusalem, or sorry, in, in Israel at the time, until at least after the destruction of the temple. And yet Jesus is depicted as going into a synagogue in Nazareth, definitely not a fly speck if it has a synagogue, right? So given all of these things that we know, what kind of a picture are we left with at the end? And can we really say that this is a Jesus that the Gospels are depicting? Or is it something very, very different? Sorry, was that to me specifically? Well, to anyone on the affirmative side. Um, I disagree with several of the premises. I think it is simply not true that Nazareth didn't exist at the time of Jesus. The archaeologists are confident that it did, but it was a little place. I think it is simply not true to say that we can say that as certain. The archaeologists say there is evidence... I I don't know whether Alaric is thinking of Tiberias, which was a city on the Lake of Galilee that was built on a a graveyard. But I'm not aware of any evidence that there was a graveyard at Nazareth at all. No, I was wrong. I looked it up in the break, and the guy who found an ossuary there uh, was shown to be a fraud. So Uh there wasn't even that. Okay, so Nazareth was just a no, little tiny town. No, no mention of it anywhere in terms of like anyone saying that there was a place there. Correct. F- for 400 years after. That's absolutely correct. There isn't. But there are archaeological remains dated to the first century. Even the Talmud, which lists yes. 62 cities and towns in Galilee doesn't mention a Nazareth. And Josephus, who mentions supposedly, even more. Supposedly a city. 
can, 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 I, can I just jump in and ask Christopher? Um, you talk about archaeologists. Who, yeah. Can you name these archaeologists and where they're from? I could if you gave me ten minutes with my computer. Okay, okay. Uh, I could certainly put you onto where the results are published. That would be no problem. And they're well known. I mean, the place has been excavated. And uh, the fact that it wasn't mentioned suggests to me that it wasn't worth mentioning, which is what makes it interesting that they remembered Jesus had been born there. It wasn't a very important place. Okay. So uh, if, if, if it did exist and it was just a fly speck, why did it have a synagogue? And, if, and considering yep. that synagogues, the only synagogues that we know of existing pre-temple destruction were synagogues that diaspora Jews returning to Israel needed a place to go to worship that they felt comfortable in. And that's not the sort of place that Jesus would have been going into. Why was it written that way? Why, why was there a synagogue in Nazareth? What makes you think there weren't synagogues in the first century? Because of the archaeological evidence that shows that, that synagogues did not exist until after the destruction of the temple. No, that's, that's the actually, whole reason that, for that's synagogues, actually not correct. the Jews that were outside of Israel. That's actually not correct. The archaeological evidence has only found synagogues from later. So, again, we're, we're expected to believe that an imagined source that doesn't exist is, no, no. is how we're supposed you're to... you're expected to believe that writers like Josephus, who mention synagogues, are also correct... And the, according to the Jewish tradition, to found a synagogue, you only need ten Jewish men. A small town, a really tiny town, can have a synagogue. The general view on synagogues in, in scholarly circles is that in the first century, most synagogues were not buildings. Synagogue was the word for the communal meeting, which could take place somewhere, any time, and sometimes had a building as well. But it's quite true that archaeologically first century synagogues have not yet been found. But that does not mean that synagogues didn't exist. Okay, but that, that's that means part they of my haven't been question, found. Uh, which, which I still want to come back to, which is if the gospel writers can't agree on where Jesus was born or at least the reason that he got there uh, and who his, his genealogy was, what reason do we have to believe anything else that they say? That's a good question. And what I would say as a historian is that what we know about Jesus' adult life is far more historically reliable than what we know about his birth. I agree with you, there are major problems with the accounts in Matthew and Luke's Gospel. They start with the fact that it's not in Mark. Mark doesn't seem to think it's worthwhile telling stories of Jesus' birth. Matthew and Luke have stories, John again doesn't. Yes, there are historical problems with those stories, but there are far fewer problems with the stories of Jesus' adult life. They are much more historically credible. So the biblical Jesus, the adult, we're better off than the baby Jesus, the child. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to thank all four scholars, uh, all four people for coming along. Uh, and I was talking to the good third speaker about how I've taken the path of history but the medieval, so I'm sorry if I asked something in ignorance about this early period. Um, so my first... I have two short questions. The first question is... Excuse me, can you just come forward into the mic? Yep, yep. is that fine? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Is this fine? Yes? Okay. So my first question has to do with... Uh, directed to the fourth speaker... Uh, the affirmative speaker said something about several criteria of uh, attestation uh, or uh, reliability. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you about the criterion of embarrassment. You said when you were speaking that this is a useless, or you implied that this is a useless criteria, but that to me doesn't make any sense. And what I'd like to ask you is, in, for example, the, uh, the Gospels record uh, or record of women, for example, finding Jesus' tomb empty first, and then they tell the male disciples, in a culture like the Jewish culture, in which women's testimony was not reliable testimony, why would people try to create a story to persuade their fellow Jews of the fact that Jesus is the, uh, the risen Messiah by mentioning women as the first finders of the tomb that tell the men? Um, don't know. Uh, it's a fiction, and you'd have to ask the author. I think I know. Uh, hang on. Uh, Raphael's got Raphael an answer. Go. Sure. Could it be perhaps that since Christianity is a new religion, 
they actually have a reason to fabricate this story. They have a reason to show, well, we have a different attitude to women. We have written this for a reason. So, a conspiracy? No, not a conspiracy. Not a conspiracy, no. Can, uh, look... Th- <laughs> The earliest sayings in terms of the Gospel of Q, Gospel of Thomas, the the earliest sayings that are attributed to Jesus, there's no evidence that they're actually attributed to Jesus in in those texts, Um, but there's a bunch of sayings that someone got from somewhere that were written down that have been since attributed to Jesus, are mainly along the lines of a radical egalitarianism, saying everybody's equal, which is radical even today. Now, the equality of women as part of that I don't see as, as any more radical. Can, can, I, can I just ask a question? You talk about the Gospel of Thomas um, being one of the earliest sources. Well, no, there's, there's a lot of debate about whether it's... Uh, I, I would say, I would agree with scholars who say it's earlier because it's, uh, I mean after Mark and Matthew and Luke and everyone have written theirs, yep. why go back to just a list of sayings? I, I, I'd say... Can I ask you about the radical egalitarianism of, of the Gospel of Thomas, particularly in relation to women? No, not, not particularly in relation to women. Indeed I didn't, not. I didn't say in regard to women. I said a, a preaching a radical egalitarianism. Um, and this is this is Jesus seminar stuff. This is what it is indeed. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the reasons I don't believe it. Um, <laughs> the reason I don't believe that Jesus was a radical egalitarian, though I think it's a nice theory, and I would like to believe it because I'm an egalitarian myself. But the reason I don't believe it is that Jesus talked extensively about his twelve as the new leadership of the new Israel. In other words, he did have a structure of hierarchy, but. He was more egalitarian than many people in his time. But I think the whole argument for the radical egalitarianism of Jesus, it looks more Californian than it looks Galilean. (laughs) Okay. Can we go to the next? Could I get back to the question about the criteria? I have a second quick question. Actually, I didn't do the embarrassment bit. Uh, Okay, we want to get through the questions, so can we ask? Okay, hang on. on. On the embarrassment bit... Um, if you're talking about a fictional account, like you could ask why the author in Harry Potter made the characters do this, why the author of any fictional account made, made the characters do something which in the context of those characters would have been embarrassing for those characters and you can say, well, that makes it historical. But Harry, Harry Potter, Potter would is reject true. that. But it Harry is Potter true is because not the author biography. of Harry Potter is a muggle and she portrays muggles <laughs> as evil. So it must be true, because that's too embarrassing. But those aren't, those aren't first century biography literature. My second question, however, has to do with... So there's a special rule for first century literature that doesn't apply to any other literature. I'll ask my second question, thank you. I'll ask uh, to, the third spe- uh, to the second speaker of the negative side about your criteria of knowledge. You use a lot of... Uh, you paid the uh, affirmative uh, speakers the compliment of calling their position not based on logic, reason or science. Um, and so... And you use a lot of languages like how do we know such and such was the case or how can we be sure that such and such is the case. But it seems to me that you're questioning the uh, inductive method which all historians use for all of history as a kind of an illegitimate or, or, or a bad way of doing history in favour of a more absolute scientific um, uh, method. Is that the kind of thing you're going for there? Very That's glad the you brought that question. up. There's three, type, there's three main types of argumentation you can make to prove God's existence. No, no, this is not about God's existence. This is about the historical method in the text, how we know something in the text is, say, sure. It reliable. sounded like you're referring to a priori reasoning when you mentioned inductive reasoning. Uh, I'm saying, the, yes, the inductive, where you infer something is most reasonably the case from evidence. And why I would say evidence. that's really not valid. You, don't, you seem to be implying that. Is that the case? In a sense, yes. When we're talking about supernatural claims, the three main types of argumentation... Oh, sorry. The three main types of argumentation you can use to demonstrate the supernatural, whether it's the biblical Jesus, whether it's God's existence, whether it's Thor's existence, etc., are historical claims, which you've already established. You cannot prove supernatural claims historically. A priori and a posteriori. A priori is unconfirmed. 
It is unconfirmed. It is not tested. We do not know. It's an interesting theory. The a priori argumentation that we have been given to confirm supernatural events, such as from William Lane Craig, can easily be discredited. They rely on premises that are unproven or outright false, and they do not flow logically. The only way you can do it, the only way you can demonstrate anything supernatural, such as God's existence or the biblical Jesus' existence, and I just want to make sure we're still talking about the biblical Jesus, not historical Jesus. We... We acknowledge there could be a historical Jesus. We're focused on the biblical. Oh, he doesn't. I do. We are, we are concerned with the biblical Jesus. And that is a supernatural thing that we're discussing. The only way you can prove that is a posteriori, which is also known as empirical observation, the foundation of modern science. And that has never been done. For some reason, it should be the easiest thing to do if God exists, yet it has never been done. But the problem with that, uh, I would like to comment on and just go to the last second half of the question, is that science seems to be fundamentally inductive, and yet you reject induction while affirming science. Because, for example, you might say that water boils when it gets to 100 degrees, but you don't need to get all the water in all the universe and then boil it to 100 degrees. You can take a sample and then infer something. So, in inferring from evidence is valid and I just like to understand which I don't understand is why in in your approach to the New Testament Jesus why you seem to think that the absence of evidence means the evidence of absence if there is I've never claimed that it seems that you're inferring that from saying no. that this because it's not deductively absolutely that. empirical uh, well what could re- I suppose the question at no, the end I, of the day I'm is, seriously claiming that because okay, the okay. closest sources to Jesus to the time Jesus was supposed to exist, do not mention a historical okay, figure. Yes. Uh, so, okay. So uh, we've the had question that assertion three times or four times now, That's not true. and I simply tell you, you are mistaken. The You're earliest sources do say it. You're drawing such a long bow with the sources. Okay, you I, quote. I'm, I'm going to uh, jump in here, and this, this, we, we've had this argument. Pe- people can decide either way, and uh, I'm going to go to the next question. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, hi guys, thanks for a great debate. Um, my first, I'm so, sorry, can you speak into the mic? Uh, a bit yeah, more? so um, thanks for a great debate, guys. Um, I've got a question. It's in two parts. The first part is directed to the, um, the fourth speaker. Um, my name's Alaric, by the way, for everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I forgot your names. Um, um, you, you you pulled up an analogy um, that you know Hermione's smart. You know she was written about, and so therefore we can all believe her and. You know, people like to talk about James Bond. Well, I just have to point out the technicality that uh, neither Ian Fleming, who wrote James Bond, or J.K. Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter, claimed that either of their characters existed. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all claim that Christ did. So no, I, they don't. The books do Only claim Luke that Harry did. Potter existed. The books claim, but she who Only is like Matthew, Luke Mark, Luke, but she, she who is the author of the books claims does not claim that they exist. Yeah, we don't we don't have access to Mark or Matthew second, or Luke, but only Luke claims any sort of uh, historicity. The others are just stories, and within the story, it doesn't claim anything. But neither ne- none of them suggest that it's a it's a fictional account. Could, Ian Fleming and J.K. Rowling suggest that they are fictional accounts because if they could, can I just jump in here because this, yep. this is a, this is a thing uh, an argument that's been made. Uh, by this side. I just want to go to Marilyn and go, how would you respond to this side who's saying, you know, J.K. Roll, you know, Harry, this whole argument of Harry Potter, James Bond, all this kind of stuff, multiple attestation, and therefore, um, because we reject James Bond, we've got to reject the Gospels. So what I would say that's, to that... That's the straw man. I never said that. Okay, I said applying, okay, sorry, the same, yeah. the applying the same logic that he applies to claim historicity could be claimed historicity for those. But okay, take yeah. the card. Okay. So what I would say to that is that the gospel authors do believe they're, they're writing about a historical character. Luke particularly says that he has lots of accounts of Jesus and he has a particular man, Theophilus, that he wants to provide certainty to. Theophilus had received an oral tradition and he is confused about that oral tradition. And instead of Luke saying to him, read Mark or read other sources, all these these many sources, Luke says, I'm going to investigate everything from the beginning. And he pegs his gospel to dates, 
to rulers of the time. He pegs it to um, geography that we know existed. And so there are many elements in this that... Um, that show a real attempt to write a historical account. I respond. Um, okay, where is this historical evidence of the slaughter of innocents? Nothing in history. Correct. Where is the historical evidence of what was it, what are the other things? Oh, I just I just lost. Uh, okay, can we ask? Uh, just quick response. And oh, the census. Okay. Hey, hang on, hang on. We're talking about a census where you go back to the town of your ancestors. I okay, mean... Okay. Can I just jump in? Quick response, next question. The census of Quirinius is a huge and difficult historical problem which has not been decisively resolved by anybody. It may be unhistorical or it may not. That is not clear. What is clear is that Luke is trying to do history. He may have made a mistake, but he is actually trying to do history. Okay, can we go? Next yep, question. Yep. Okay, next question to the second speaker. Um, you brought up many um, books within the New Testament. Um, for example, Paul, you've mentioned several times. Um, you showed, or at least you tried to show with your diagram or with your mathematical equation, um, that there is a less than 50% chance that even the historical Jesus existed. Um, now, this might just be a technicality, but you talk of Paul, for example, you talk of other people who wrote in the New Testament. The way you talk about them is almost as if you're implying the way you talk about them is that they existed. Um, my question is that you seem to be leaning towards that Christ as a historical figure never, never existed, but you don't seem to have a problem of talking about Paul and others quite casually as if, well, they existed. Um, I fail to see that there's any more evidence that these, um, the, the gospel writers and those who wrote the books of the New Testament existed any more than the historical Jesus existed. Well, you're exactly right. I have no vested interest in that. Well, that was that. just a clarification. Yeah, so. <laughs> Besides the writings of Paul, we really don't know if Paul existed. Well, there we go. Just um, to clarify that one. The, yeah. the gospel writers are anonymous. But someone we don't know wrote who them. they are. Someone, someone wrote, the wrote them, right? Yep. But they're anonymous. We don't know who they are or why they wrote them. It's also a bit of an irrelevant point. But you'd be willing to agree that, for example, the author Paul, um, he may not, the person who wrote that may not even be Paul. Perhaps, perhaps he did not, yeah. yeah. But it's also a bit of a relevant point you mentioned, because when, when you spoke about the 50%, maybe Jesus didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, we're talking tonight about the biblical Jesus, and I showed that with the biblical Jesus, is actually less than 1%. I really don't want to get drawn into arguing maybe Jesus didn't even exist. I brought it I up do. because it's so... I brought it up because it's sort of related to the issue. Well, we're just adding, sources just, are just, so just dodgy adding on to that. that. Could uh, okay, can I, can I yeah. jump in and go, go to the next okay, question? Sure. Sorry. You, uh... Hello, Tess. Yeah, for you guys. Sorry, they're Christians. So the word Bible never actually appears in the Bible. <laughs> and some Christians like Martin Luther wanted to remove certain books from the Bible, which was for centuries, you know, accepted in both kind of the Western tradition and the Eastern tradition. What authority did Martin Luther have to remove books from the Bible and nearly remove the book of Revelations? Surely if the canon was accepted previously, isn't accepted now, wasn't a good source to begin with anyway. And under what authority is the Bible what it is today? And what about like the infancy gospels of, say, Thomas and James? Why weren't they included in their biblical canon? And finally, Jesus describes God as, you know, ultimately, you know, just loving, continually loving, surely a loving God would love us so much that he'd place an authority on earth which would say this is the true path of salvation. We have over 70,000 Christian denominations now. Why okay, can, 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 I, can I jump in? Uh, it's a really valid question about different denominations, different ways to God, but I think it's off topic. So, How about what, the first one? Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah. What, can you just ask in yeah. one sentence your first question again? Thank so you. like the word Bible never appears in the Bible. And, you know, why is the, ca the biblical canon now accepted now, not previously accepted? And like if you can change the canon so easily, surely that source is a bit dodgy. Can I comment on that very briefly? Martin Luther had serious doubts about one book in the canon, the letter of James. Yeah, but he, he was going to remove the book of Revelations until his mates told him to calm down. But he never did. And the reason he didn't is that there was an overwhelming consensus that the canon was the canon and unchangeable. And there'd been an overwhelming consensus for more than a thousand years when Martin Luther 
had doubts about one or two books. The question, why isn't the word Bible in the Bible, is a silly question, because the word biblion simply means book. And that word does turn up in the Bible quite a lot. But the Bible doesn't talk about itself as a Bible. The Bible is a collection of books. And yes, put together by later people, the collection. Absolutely. Just like the works of Tacitus. Just like the letters of Cicero were collected by later people. Just like the letters of Pliny the Elder. This is what historians deal with. Documents collected together by later people which we then try to use as the basis for inference about earlier events. It's not perfect, but it's what historians do. Okay, I, can, I, can I add to that? Just, just that yeah, 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 go for tiny it. Bit. Um, the canonisation process was actually part of what caused the multiple attestations uh, that a lot of scholars attest to, and that, that is things like... Um, uh, John the Baptist was a was an important figure um, in in terms of the mythology. If he wasn't in there, less likely to to get in as a book. So can, there's can, evidence that can, that. can I can I jump in? The, what books are in the canon and why? And all this kind of great question. I don't think it relates to the historical okay. Jesus okay. And, and this question. So I'm going to just go to. Uh, we're going to have two more questions. I'm sorry. I'm so. I'm sorry. Maybe two. Maybe three. I'm going to say two. Definitely. Maybe three. Okay. Let's go. So, Dr. Forbes, you, you talked about multiple attestations yep. to lots of different things. Um, just quickly looking up, there's actually no multiple attestations to Nazareth. There's the Talmud 63. I have to correct you, Alaric. 63 um, references to Galilean towns, not just towns within Israel. Galilean towns, and. Not once is Nazareth mentioned. There's, his, there's historical references to every town in pretty much Galilee except for Nazareth until the 4th century. There's no reference in the Old Testament and there's no reference by Paul to Nazareth, your own book. But there is a town there. Yes. That, a 1st century and, town. And evidence shows that they found a sandal that was from before the 1st century... <laughs> And six lamps. Now, the old Jewish tradition, wait, the old Jewish tradition of grave sites was to put a lamp on the grave to guide the dead's way. People do have lamps for other reasons as well. <laughs> but why didn't they find any buildings? But they, did. <laughs> they did. They found the foundations of several no. farm buildings. They found a number of cisterns. The they found silos. They, the only thing that actually carbon dates prior to the first century is a well. That's it. And that's online. Oh, in that case, it <laughs> must be true. <laughs> it that's must actually, be oh, true. That's actually peer-reviewed <laughs> online. <laughs> oh. No, peer-reviewed. Okay. Not actually made up. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay can, can I ask a question? But is it on Wiki? Um, no, no. So peer-reviewed, where, where is uh, it? JesusNeverExisted.com has about 60 articles linked. Uh, and that... Of course, is a fair and unbiased source. I, I, okay, 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 okay. Can, and can you're I? a fair and unbiased source. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, Colin, go for it. G'day, uh, thank you guys for sharing. Um, so my question concerns the Gnostic Gospels or Gospels in that kind of stream. What, what, what relevance, or is there any relevance uh, of these Gnostic Gospels to the question of who Jesus is? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. The Gnostic Gospels are, a, are very good sources for second century Christianity. So what we have in the canon are earlier accounts and what we have in the Gnostic Gospels are texts from second century Christianity. So there will definitely be elements of the story in the Bible in the Gnostic Gospels. You'll have figures like Peter, or you'll have figures like Jesus, of course, Judas, Mary. So there will be elements that you'll find there, but they are later documents. Okay, very quickly, can we go to the last question and, yeah, go. Oh, I think you can... <laughs> Um, look, I'd just like to challenge the good professor because there are many points he got away with without being challenged, and I think they're very important. Well, well, wait, can, can I ask you to ask a question? Just one question, please. I've got so many. Yeah, yeah well, you can ask him just after. One. But just one. I'm happy to stay around and talk about them after. That's fine. Um, 
pick, pick one. Pick one. Okay. Um, well, look, an easy one, I guess. Um, G it was said many times that Jesus would be the king of the Jews. It was prophesied many times in the Gospels. He was never king of the Jews. He th and, the, and the Gospel writers and Paul couldn't get the Jews to, uh, to uh, convert, to become Christians, so they went for the Gentiles. I'm sorry, is, I, I don't know what the question is. So, um, does it make any sense that Jesus was such a failure? If he was a biblical Jesus, why didn't he have any um, substantive conversion? He was supposed to be the king of the Jews. Why wasn't he ever king of the Jews? What makes him biblical other than historical if the most fundamental reason that he was here never existed? He claimed, I think it's reasonable historically to suggest that Jesus implied the claim that he was the king of the Jews. That is what they executed him for. They executed him for being a threat to public security under Roman law. And if he was followed, and as it says in the, in the New Testament many, many times, there were hordes following him, many people followed him, they witnessed his miracles yes. and despite all those miracles when they put him on the cross not one person stood up and said hey guys we got a problem and it, yet the whole of the people, all the people in the synagogue, he had hundreds of followers, he left hundreds of followers behind in the, when, he, when he went into the desert, when he went up the mountain all these miracles that happened and nobody thought to say hey guys Let's protest. It's a question, and the simple answer to it is that Judea is under martial law. And if the Romans want to execute somebody, you'd better not try to stop them, or you may be on cross number two yourself. Roman martial law was serious. It's quite clear that the Roman authorities thought Jesus was a potential danger precisely because he came to Jerusalem with a crowd. Lots of other people had come to Jerusalem for the festival, but the fact that Jesus was coming with a crowd of supporters saying, Hosanna to the King of the Jews, etc., that made him a danger. So they got rid of him. But come on, let's be... Okay, 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 why did they all say crucify him, crucify him when he was the king of the Jews, when he was this beloved person? Now, when he claimed to be the king of the Jews and had substantial followings in Galilee, he did not have substantial followings in Jerusalem. The high priests got in rent a crowd and it worked very nicely for them. Jesus' main support base was back in Galilee. In Jerusalem, he with, didn't with, have a strong support with due base. respect, that's uh, uh, debating uh, uh, okay. uh, uh, In summary, Jesus was not the character the Bible portrayed him as. Okay. In summary, I have six or seven points where I think he was, and I laid them out in my speech. I, okay, I'm going I'm to stop there. Um, I, I just want to finish off by saying, first of all, thanks to the Roxbury, and thanks to our presenters also. Can you give them a round of applause? And I'll just say a uh, final two things. I think most of our presenters are staying around for some, for maybe a, a few minutes at least. You could hit them up with questions. And the, and the other thing is, if, if Jesus is someone you want to explore more, we are actually kicking off a series, my church, Resolved. We are kicking off a series on Jesus' central ethical teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, this Sunday. If you want to look that up, resolve.org.au, we would love to have you. Have a great night and thanks for coming.